right, I'm going to go ahead just so we have enough time for B to give her presentation. So good morning and welcome to our webinar on Munchausen by proxy guidelines for identification and intervention. We appreciate you taking time out of your day to join us. Before we get started, I just want to cover a few housekeeping items. This webinar is produced by the CADA Center, a project of the Center for Innovation and Resources. We are grateful to our funders at the California Governor's Office of Emergency Services, Victim Services Branch for making this presentation possible. It is also co-sponsored by CAPSAC, the California American Professional Society on the Abuse of Children. And for those of you who can hear me, this might seem obvious, but I just wanna remind everyone to turn on their speakers. Please note that there are two features to ask questions. Use the Q&A feature to ask the presenter any questions that you may have regarding content. We will begin with questions that have been emailed in prior to the live session. If your question is not answered right away, please wait until the end of the presentation and we will do our best to cover everything. The chat panel is where you can ask tech support questions. Make sure you choose all panelists from the drop down menu and we will answer questions immediately in the chat panel. Now on to our presenter. We are very pleased to have Beatrice Yorker presenting for you today. Beatrice is a nationally known expert on Munchausen by proxy, also known as medical child abuse. She is a professor of nursing, criminal justice, and criminalistics at California State University, Los Angeles. She's also a child psychiatric nurse and an attorney who has published on Munchausen by proxy child abuse. So just give me a moment to transfer the controls over to B and we will get started. Okay, can you hear me? Perfect. All right, let's go full screen then. So welcome everybody. This is a great group of attendees. I reviewed the attendance list and 33 counties are represented on this webinar and we have all disciplines from nursing, law enforcement, prosecutors, physicians, a lot of child protective services, a lot of um, therapists and child advocates. So this is great. This is a wonderful interdisciplinary group. So how I got into this strange area of child abuse, I was working as a child psychiatric nurse in Atlanta, Georgia in a large hospital. And I was also going to law school part time. And we got our first case of a little boy who was 18 months old and he came in with bleeding ears again and again. And this is in the early 1980s. So it was shortly after Munchausen by proxy was even known. And the pediatrician in charge said to me, because I was on the psych team, she said, B, I wonder, because usually ear infections are clear drainage, I wonder if the mom could be um, doing this to the child. And she had me read Roy Meadows' article on Munchausen by proxy. And that was fascinating. And the case that really got to me that sort of talked about critical thinking in healthcare was a little girl who had multiple urinary tract infections. She'd been in the hospital five times. She'd been treated with antibiotics. She'd had tubes put up her urethra. She'd had x-rays. Um, and every time they treated her urinary tract infection with antibiotics, she'd come right back in with a raging infection. So this time when she was in the hospital, the nurse said to Dr. Meadow, you know, Dr. Meadow, if I collect the urine specimen, it comes back clean. But if mom collects the urine specimen, it comes back loaded with red blood cells, white blood cells, and bacteria. So Dr. Meadows said, oh, isn't that interesting? So he set it up to have the 6 a.m. urine specimen on the little girl collected by the nurse. And then at 10 a.m., the nurse handed a urine cup to the mom and said, would you collect a urine specimen? They were both sent down to the lab. And the lab technician saw the first 6 a.m. completely clear. And the second urine specimen had lots of red blood cells and bacteria. And that lab tech went one step further. He typed the blood in the little girl's urine, and it wasn't the little girl's blood type. 
it was the mother's blood type. And that got us started on this baffling area of why on earth would a mother do that to her child? And we'll get into that in a minute. So for years, I've been working in this field and APSAC, the American Professional Society on the Abuse of Children, there's a link for you to go if you would like to join. And I hope lots of you already are members. In 1995, we formed a task force on Munchausen by proxy. And by 2002, we published a theme issue of child maltreatment. And then since then, there's been a backlash. There's been a lot of uh, movement in the field. And then finally, over the last three to four years, a group of 18 of us um, representing various disciplines started meeting regularly at the San Diego Conference on Child Maltreatment, and we came up with national guidelines. Thanks to APSAC, they are making these available to the public for free. And they published a theme issue of the APSAC advisor, which is also available for educational purposes. Um, and I'm gonna to go to the link of the advisor just because I want you all to go here. And this is a wealth of resources. On page eight are the guidelines. So pages eight to 32 are the guidelines. And Emma is gonna send you all a, a copy and a link of the actual guidelines because this is our gift to you for being on this webinar. Um, and then on page 32, uh, two pediatricians, well, a pediatrician child psychiatrist wrote all the different types of illnesses that can be induced, and that's for particularly healthcare settings to download that. For all you law enforcement, prosecutors, attorneys, children's counsel in the room, page 53, is by Michael Weber. He's an investigator in Texas who has prosecuted 19 cases of medical child abuse. He's proposed legislation making it illegal for a, making it a form of child abuse and a crime to lie to a physician in order to get them to perform unneeded procedures, surgeries, or medications. Um, Munchausen by proxy in the mental health setting. Uh, Brenda Bursch, uh, who's here at UCLA, and Herb Schreier up in Oakland, wrote about the fact that it's not just uh, in hospitals, that in mental health settings we are seeing this as well. Uh, children on the spectrum, sometimes their parents fake that or lie about it. And then we have a wonderful set of guidelines for risk assessment, support, and treatment of spouses and non-offending family members. Then Brenda Bursch did an article on child protective services management, and I'll go into a little bit of that in the slides. Okay, I've talked about Roy Meadows' article. In the 80s, we called it factitious disorder by proxy because there at least was a diagnosis in the DSM about factitious disorder. Now, factitious disorder is when a person makes themselves sick for the purposes of getting medical attention. An example is a nurse who passes out at work and they rush her down to the emergency room and they find out she's got terribly low blood sugar. They tell her to eat before she comes to work. It happens again and they go, oh my gosh, she must have a pancreatic tumor to be producing so much insulin that it's causing her blood sugar to go this low. They remove her pancreas. The next time she passes out, they take her to the emergency room and they go, oh, maybe the insulin wasn't coming from her pancreas. And the nurse confessed that she had been stealing her patient's insulin, injecting herself so that she would go into hypoglycemic shock. That is factitious disorder or Munchausen syndrome. When it's a by proxy, instead of making yourself sick, you make your child sick or a dependent in your care. I also study nurses who are charged with serial murder of patients by injecting them with potassium chloride to cause heart attacks. And that's another form of Munchausen by proxy. 
Um, APSAT called it pediatric condition falsification, and that's pretty limited to the healthcare setting. And then they added abuse, which is abuse by pediatric uh, condition falsification. In 2009, um, Tom Ressler and Carol Jenny, a pair of pediatricians in Colorado and now in Seattle, wrote a book called Medical Child Abuse. And that was kind of controversial as a term. It made it sound like the doctor was abusing the child, which indeed can happen. But the doctor only does it because the mother has lied or induced an illness in the child that required unnecessary treatment or necessary treatment if the child was poisoned. And then in 2013, the American Academy of Pediatrics Committee on Child Abuse published caregiver fabricated illness in a child. And that's another term that we look at. So the physicians in the group may be asking, is there an ICD code for this? And there is, and there's also a DSM-5 code, and it's factitious disorder imposed on another. And here are the criteria. It's falsification of physical or psychological signs or symptoms or inducing the injury associated with identified deception, presenting another, the victim, to others as ill or impaired. The behavior is evident even in the absence of obvious external rewards, and the behavior is not better accounted for by another mental disorder, such as a delusional belief system or acute psychosis. And the diagnosis is given to the perpetrator. Whereas medical child abuse, the diagnosis is given to the child. It's like the difference between pedophilia, a diagnosis that could be given to a perpetrator, whereas sexual abuse is the diagnosis given to the child and it doesn't even care what the motive of the perpetrator is. The kinds of presentations of falsified symptoms include medical. Almost any condition may be falsified. You can read Kelly and Wong's article. Most frequently, though, are fevers, seizures, and vomiting in a child. The psychological uh, symptoms could be reported or coached. Again, hyperactivity disorder is very often exaggerated, coached, or um, reported by a parent. And then when other people observe the child, they don't see as much of the hyperactivity. Um, educational, the parent may report delays and special needs to the school system requiring accommodation, and even pets. Um, the whole veterinary field is now aware that there are some people, if they don't have children in the house, but they thrive with medical attention, they'll use their pets to get medical attention. The kinds of falsification that can occur are either lying or withholding information deliberately so that it confuses the doctor or the treating physician. It can be exaggeration. For example, the child's temp may have gone up to 99.8, and the mother says, oh, it was 103. Um, simulation is when you uh, produce symptoms. For example, the mother who put her own menstrual blood in her little girl's urine specimen. That would be simulating a urinary tract infection. Neglect. So the mother just doesn't feed the child and then takes the child in when it's lost weight and it's dehydrated and says the child keeps vomiting. It can't keep food down. When in fact, the mother is actually starving the child. Induction is when the parent actually causes the symptoms. This can be smothering to cause apnea. It can be over-medicating to cause lethargy or ataxia. A classic example is a child who's on anti-seizure medications. The parent gives too much of that and the child comes in very wobbly and ataxic and is then evaluated for um, some kind of neurological disorder above and beyond the seizures. And then coaching, telling the child, um, you know, you were vomiting this morning or when the child was actually just a little nauseous. <clears throat> so there's some interesting cases and I'm going to show you some of the worst of the worst. If you haven't already seen the HBO documentary, and this is a documentary of an actual case, 
Mommy, Dead, and Dearest. I very much encourage you to go and see that. Now I'm going to give you a warning because what I'm going to show you is some covert video surveillance of recent cases, and the second one is an act, actually a much older case. The videos have been shortened, so I'm not going to put you through a full 60 seconds of watching a parent um, harm their child. But we'll go ahead and click on these. Um, I'm gonna go directly to them because YouTube otherwise asks my permission. So this is the first one. You will have the link to this video on your slides. Put the four-month-old baby boy in a room with a surveillance camera because I suspected he was a victim of child abuse. A little boy named Raiden came to Cook Children's Medical Center because he had stopped breathing. At first, doctors thought it was a severe case of reflux when acid from the stomach backs up into the esophagus and did surgery. But when the baby stopped breathing again a day or two later, doctors were shocked at what they saw on the video. At first, the baby appears fussy, and his mother, Shantaniqua Scott, then 17 years old, appears to comfort him. But then, the video shows her putting a blanket over the baby's face. Police and prosecutors say she's clearly smothering the baby. It goes on for more than 20 seconds. A nurse briefly comes in the room. The mother checks her cell phone. Then the courtroom watched in silence what happened next. Scott covered her baby's face with her bare hand. At first, the baby was kicking and fighting back. It went on for one minute and 14 seconds. By then, the baby was limp. Scott picked up her cell phone again and appeared to make a call. Seconds later, with alarms going off, indicating the baby had stopped breathing, doctors and nurses rushed in to resuscitate him. Doctors testified the baby would have died had they not been there to help. And a recorded confession also played for the jury. Scott admitted smothering her baby. She told detectives it was hard being a teenage mother, complained the baby's father didn't help take care of him, and said she didn't want to deal with the stress anymore. The baby survived and incredibly was later released from the hospital in stable condition. He's now in foster care. Okay, before I go to the next one, a couple of things about this particular case. Michael Weber, this is one of his cases, and he's the investigator in Texas. And for all the prosecutors, I'm going to give you a link to um, his article in the FBI Law Enforcement Journal. This mother said when she confessed, which is unusual, most of the mothers deny, but she said she did it because she was a teenage mo mother, she was overwhelmed and overburdened, and the father didn't help. What I've learned in working with many of these mothers is that they very often will come up with an excuse. One mother who injected fecal material into her son's IV line to cause him to almost die with a septic infection. When I was talking to her after we saw the videotape, she said, yeah, I only did it that once. The nurses were out to get me. That's why they put the camera in my room. And I did it because my husband and I'd had a big fight and he left the hospital and I was afraid he was gonna leave me. So I thought, well, if our kid spikes a temp and gets a high fever, he'll have to come back. So that's the kind of rationale. And as with any perpetrator, they typically deny, minimize. When confronted with evidence, they will justify and then blame the victim or blame the nurses or blame the doctors. Um, this next video, oops, I think I will have to pull it back up. Um, so this next visit video includes some old videotape. In one of law enforcement's most bizarre and baffling crimes, video cameras are pumping stained the lives of victims too young to speak out for themselves. In these disturbing videotapes, infants suffer but ultimately survive while the footage becomes an education tool for special FBI agent Larry Brutmaker. 
for three or four hours. This is the most caring, loving mother you've ever seen. And then, just like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, something happens and that person becomes an abuser. The strange crime is called Munchausen syndrome by proxy, when parents secretly make their children sick to gain attention or sympathy for themselves. Assigned to the Minneapolis Bureau, Ruth Baker became the FBI's Munchausen expert after helping a local hospital investigate a suspected case, and now uses these videos to educate others. In this surveillance video, medical staff leaves a suspected Munchausen's son with his baby. When he's sure he's alone, the father puts the child in its crib, then smokes until it loses consciousness. After running for help, the father feigns concern, basking in the attention. This parent was convicted of abuse and separated from his child, one of several hundred Munchausen's cases uncovered in the U.S. each year. Munchausen parents not only smother their children with their hands or bodies, they also introduce harmful bacteria into their feeding tubes and even tamper with their medication or poison their food. So I apologize for giving you your own little bit of um, of post-traumatic stress disorder by watching those videos. Um, it's very disturbing, it's very distressing, and um, you do have links if you wanna calm down and at any future point watch them because um, when it's on full screen, it gets a lot blurrier and sometimes you can't see it as well as when it's on smaller screen. I wanna say a few things about the father that we saw. Yes, there are some male perpetrators. Um, so that's just an example of that. Another thing is, is that they um, fast forwarded through about 60 seconds of him holding that little girl down with her face in the bottom of the crib while her legs kick and it's excruciating. And that is not the protocol that we have established for covert video surveillance. Um, I can talk more and go into more detail about covert video surveillance for those of you who are interested. Um, I did write a law review article back when I was in Atlanta and we'd had about 12 cases at Scottish Rite Children's Hospital. And they said, well, B, you're in law school. Would you please tell us if it's legal to set up these hidden cameras? And I reviewed the Fourth Amendment and I reviewed all the case law and I said, no, it's absolutely legal especially if it's done for the purpose of diagnosis and by medical professionals, not by law enforcement. And by the way, just have patients sign on the admitting consent form that they consent to the taking of still or moving pictures for the purposes of patient safety. So I saw about 12 of the worst, I consulted on 12 of the worst cases that were caught with covert video surveillance. But then I also consulted on some cases that didn't require video surveillance. Um, toxicology screens, direct evidence, there's a lot of ways that you can get good evidence of this. And actually the gold standard, and it's race ipsa loquitur, the thing speaks for itself, the gold standard of evidence is that if you separate the child from their primary caretaker, they get well, they thrive, and they don't, no longer suffer from the conditions that they had when they were with their parent. Um, another thing about the father that we just saw in that video that's classic of Munchausen is that he went to get the nurses. The purpose was not just to make the baby sick or just to stop it. The purpose was to get, to create a crisis 
to have an apnea episode. And that just plays out in that video. So um, I've been involved in several cases where I've testified both in a criminal trial and in a termination of parental rights trial. Um, if it's active induction, if it's something like the smothering and the parent is not, is still in denial and acting like, you know, they did nothing wrong, then swiftly termination of parental rights is, can be done. I've also reunified some cases. Um, so let me talk about the conviction through the IPCAC. And again, this is using a toxicology screen. So a little boy was admitted to the children's hospital for repeated vomiting and the doctor came and talked to me and the doctor said, you know, we've been wondering about Munchausen syndrome because none of the tests are showing us that he's got anything wrong, but his vomiting is so severe and his diarrhea is terrible. We're going to start working him up for Crohn's disease. And then the mother of the little boy passed a kidney stone. So she went across the street to the adult hospital for 24 hours while she passed her kidney stone. And the grandparents came to be with this little boy. And the grandmother, the mother of the mom passing a kidney stone said to the doctor, do you see that? Mom is out of the hospital and he stops vomiting. That's when they did a toxicology screen and sure enough, Ipecac, which is the poisoning antidote, that it's a little bottle of liquid that you feed to a child if they've taken pills they shouldn't or eaten something you're worried is a poison and you make them vomit. So they found Ipecac in the child's bloodstream. Then they got a warrant to search the mom's belongings. There were bottles of Ipecac, receipts of her buying Ipecac at the local Walgreens in her purse. She did confess. And um, while her child was removed and placed with the father, who was not up until that point in the child's life, the father was very grateful to be able to step up and get custody of the child. And then I did therapy with the mom for a couple of years afterwards. And because of that, I was willing to testify in her criminal trial and talk about um, her, her progress on admitting her problems. Then we had a case of a fabricator. This was very interesting. <laughs> the mother was admitted again because she said the baby kept vomiting and um, was dehydrated. So they put her in the video surveillance room because they could find nothing wrong with the child and they weren't seeing the child vomit. And what came to pass is that the mother was, um, was actually going out at night. You'd hear her on the phone because it was an audio recording and she was going out to bars to meet guys and um, was sort of using the hospital because she was overwhelmed young mother. She wasn't making the child sick. She was just lying about it. So the nurse said, well, we haven't seen the baby vomit. Uh, we need to weigh the vomit or, um, you know, see the vomit. So the mom said, oh, okay. So she walks into the bathroom and she um, puts her finger down her throat, throws up herself into the emesis basin and then pours the vomit on her baby calls the nurse and says, there, weigh the vomit. In that case, we ended up reunifying because the mom was overwhelmed. She absolutely admitted to what she'd done. She hadn't actually harmed the child other than she'd cost the hospital a lot of money by her lying. So let's talk a little bit about um, the morbidity, mortality, and how often does this happen? Um, the Flaherty and McMillan article says it's about a half to two cases per 100,000 children. Um, those of us in the field and what's happened in Texas with their 19 prosecutions is in Texas, they're identifying approximately two cases a month. But that's because they've been doing a whole lot of training 
uh, Mike Weber and Dr. Kaufman, Jamie Kaufman from Cook County Hospital, have been out and about doing trainings. And when you do trainings, you get a lot more identification and suspicion that cases might be Munchausen. Um, the mortality is, um, I've worked in cases where the children have had permanent brain damage from being suffocated or from being poisoned. They may have permanent disabilities um, from other abuse. Then, of course, there's definitely psychological harm. Uh, when we follow children up until their adulthood, they have post-traumatic stress disorder. And unfortunately, some of them cannot shake the idea that they're sick and they become making themselves sick because it's a sick role. They believe it. It's how they get attention. It's how they've been rewarded. And then the um, extreme case is in Gypsy Blanchard's case, and that's in the Mommy Dead and Dearest documentary, uh, when Gypsy was 23 years old, her mother had kept her in a wheelchair, over-medicated, multiple surgeries. Um, she he had stunted growth. And her mother had lied about her age and said she had developmental disabilities. And so she had said to the police when Gypsy ran away, she said, oh, she's a minor and she's gone off with some sex abuser. You need to return her to me. And so Gypsy felt she had no way of escaping her Munchausen mother. And so she found a boyfriend online and they plotted and murdered her mother. So that is the extreme possible outcome. Although I have certainly worked with cases where we've removed the target child and then the mother has fled that jurisdiction, gone somewhere else, married, started another family, and the next baby has died. So what should alert a physician? Um, for pediatricians, emergency rooms, primary care docs, specialists who see confusing complex multi-organ disorders that do not respond to treatment, that should cause you to consider a diagnosis of could this be induced? Could this be exaggerated? Could this be falsification? When the history provided is inconsistent with what you see, the mother says the child had a temperature of 105, and yet every time you take the temperature, it's below 100. Or the mother says the child keeps vomiting, but you never see the vomit. The clinical picture just doesn't add up. Now, the fact that the child actually has an underlying chronic illness or a condition like seizures does not mean that there's no fabrication or induction. As a matter of fact, it's often in cases where the child has had something wrong, where they have had reflux as an infant, or where they have had seizures that causes the parent to recognize that getting medical attention for whatever reason is rewarding for them. And so they do something, they get involved to make the medical attention increase. Parents who keep saying, who are not reassured. So you say to the parents, the EEG is normal. I don't think your child has seizures. I think it's just a staring spell. Or I think the child was just naturally spacing out or was just shaking a little bit. And the mother goes, but I'm, I, I'm going to go get a second opinion. I don't believe you. I know my child and I know something is wrong. So when parents aggressively keep pursuing additional, and a zebra diagnosis means, you know, instead of hearing hoofbeats and think a horse, you hear hoofbeats and think of the most exotic possible uh, galloping animal, which is a zebra or a unicorn. We also say sometimes a unicorn diagnosis. And doctor shopping. One doctor says, I think your child's okay. So the mother then goes to another doctor with an even more ramped up um, clinical picture. Now you wanna consider and rule out other diagnoses when you have all the warning signs because many mothers or parents of chronically ill children are dogged advocates for extensive diagnostic tests. They may seek far-reaching diagnoses, they may join online support groups, they may complain when the healthcare system doesn't take them seriously. They can hire attorneys, they can request for 504 accommodations for their children and individualized educational plans. 
They can mobilize other parents and become hubs of activism in the hospital. And they may even have personality issues. All of these things do not mean that it's a Munchausen case. It's certainly suspicious, and it's very common in the cases of Munchausen by proxy, but there are, th these behaviors also can happen. For example, pandas and pans, pediatric um, autoimmune neurological disorder. That's very hard to diagnose, and it's not absolutely accepted by the pediatric community. Um, but there are huge support groups um, of mothers who say, yeah, my child got a strep infection, and now they have all these horrible symptoms and behavioral symptoms, and they're not themselves. And there are places like Stanford University that specialize in treating pans or pandas. Um, but there are also, it's a very easy opportunity for parents who want to um, fake or exaggerate or lie about their children's symptoms um, because it's a controversial diagnosis. Um, a lot of cases of mitochondrial disorder, which again is complicated and controversial to diagnose, um, and that's where it seems to attract the Munchausen by proxy. Other differential diagnosis could be, are they just anxious? And are they somatizing parents? And somatizing means you focus on your physical complaints instead of your anxiety. Um, now, parental anxiety could lead to medical child abuse. So if there's no evidence of falsification or over, but it's just over medicalization, it still may be abusive, but it's not factitious disorder imposed on another. It's not a diagnosis of the perpetrator but it may still be abusive to the child to have them overly presented to the healthcare system. The parent may be delusional. Um, and again, that can be abusive to the child, but we wouldn't diagnose the mother. Malingering, and this is if it's um, falsifying the illness in order to get money. Go fund me, make a wish foundation. Those kinds of uh, websites are very often used in Munchausen cases. Now, not certainly very few of the Make-A-Wish and the GoFundMe um, accounts are fake, but when you do find someone who's falsifying, very often they're trying to get money in addition to the medical attention. Sometimes it's to get custody of their child, make the dad look bad, make the mother look bad. Um, sometimes it's to get drugs, to get opiates, painkillers. And um, if the behavior exceeds that, then you might consider a diagnosis of the mother. Medical child abuse includes parents who are overly anxious, includes parents who are delusional and about their child's health. And it applies with motivations such as financial gain, custody disputes, retaliation, ignorance, or religious, dietary, and disciplinary beliefs. So um, there is a mom who was vegan, but she was feeding her child diluted cucumber water to the point where the child was extremely failure to thrive. That's child abuse. It doesn't matter if you have dietary and religious beliefs. It's child abuse. And if they result in doctors providing unnecessary tests or treatments, it's considered medical child abuse. What do we know about the people who do this? 95% are biological mothers. There are quite a subgroup <laughs> of the other 5% who are foster mothers. And in Oakland, there was a case of a foster mother who took in medically fragile children. And it was only when the pediatrician saw a television show where the mother said the child is terminally ill. And the pediatrician knew that child and knew the child wasn't terminally ill, that they were able to intervene. And 46% um, are in healthcare related professions. The mother who gave her child Ipecac happened to be a, a gastrointestinal technician. 30% have a history of child maltreatment. But then again, compare that to the regular population, and it's 
probably 25 to 30 percent of all of us have a history of some type of childhood maltreatment, so that's not really a big indicator. 55 percent have self-destructive behaviors. 72 percent have their own history of focusing on physical disorders. And there's a subgroup, I think it's between 30 and 50 percent, who have a history of making themselves sick prior to them having children. Now, the access to personality traits and disorders are very prevalent. So when you find someone who's making their child sick, typically they have something else going on in their personality. They're histrionic, they like to create crises, borderline, sociopathic, narcissistic. And then depression is certainly in slightly higher than normal for the population and they present as knowledgeable, caring, convincing, and they have splitting behaviors when their doctor is not accommodating their requests. There's a great article in Child Abuse and Neglect that describes, that studied really just the perpetrators. And these are perpetrators in um, verified cases. So what do you do if you suspect abuse? Well, like any child abuse, you must report it. But there are also, um, there are also, I think, a lot of reluctance. Some doctors, so, well, some social workers sometimes feel like, I can't report this abuse until the doctor verifies that it is medical child abuse or until I have a verification, it's Munchausen. Um, some doctors say, well, I can't report it because I don't want anybody to tip the mom off. I don't want her to be interviewed until we figure out for sure and we do our diagnostics. Um, I'm gonna share with you an article. Oh, this is Michael Weber's. So I've given you the link to Michael Weber's investigation article in the law enforcement, um, FBI law enforcement journal. Just want you all to be aware of that. It's a great resource. Um, have Child Protective Services and law enforcement educated in cases where the suspected perpetrator might be a flight risk, or a suicide risk. So yes, you need to have a safety plan when you report this before the mother is notified. Consider covert video surveillance or assign a one-to-one -one sitter. Um, if you're in the hospital, and um, I'm happy to consult with you further on, on this, I'll give you my email at the end. And then consider further diagnostics like a toxicology screen, a record review, um, the first steps, if you suspect, are to find and preserve all social media accounts of the suspect. Reach out to collaterals, the father, relatives, teachers, specialists. Work this case in a true multidisciplinary fashion. You can't do it by yourself, neither can the other disciplines. Contact a board-certified child abuse pediatrician, medical abuse expert in your jurisdiction. So if you don't know who yours is, um, again, email me. For those of you in LA, and LA is very well represented on this webinar, we have Brenda Bursch and Claudia Wang at Children's, or at UCLA. We have Karen Imagawa at LA Children's, and um, absolutely get them involved. They are experts on this. Once you get the, oh, don't just get the medical records. Get school records, dental records, fire department and 9-11 records. Sometimes these folks just like to have crises. Um, yeah, uh, employment records, if that's possible. Depositions, legal testimony. Some of these people are um, turn their crisis creating into um, legal dramas as well. Veterinary records and absolutely, first and foremost, social media. As a matter of fact, I need to reorganize that slide because social media has to be locked down right away. Michael Weber has been able to prosecute these cases because he will have the um, photographs of the child, the narrative that goes with it saying, my child is dying, my child is terminally ill, and this is on their social media. And you go to the hospital and they go, no, the child was just in for diagnostics. And the mother posted this photo while the child had all these tubes in them. So sort the records of the children and the parent. Look at who instigated the presentation. 
Was it always the same parent saying this child is sick? Who provided the history? Um, and one doctor said, well, the mom sent me a photograph. The child had a rash. And so Brenda goes, was the child's face in the same picture as the rash? Because doctors will get photographs of a rash all the time. And until you connect and make sure that rash was not taken off some website or was not taken a long time ago or does not belong to the child. So you just want to line all that up. Records may provide information that falsification has not occurred. It may back up the fact this is a chronically ill child. They do have the records of the original EKGs that showed that there was a heart condition. <coughs> you want to get a graph of the records with rows that describe the date, the location, the signs and symptoms, the objective test results, and then the conclusions and any other comments. Here's an example by Mary Sanders. So you organize your Excel spreadsheet, you put your date, what kind of doctor, what was said, what did the person giving a history state? Then the objective findings, which may conflict because here you have the mother says, this is a preemie, four pounds in the NICU. And then you get the birth records and the baby was eight pounds, three ounces with an APGAR of nine full term. Um, same with the high fever. Again, you want to look at the actual physical sign of physical findings and then a seizure was witnessed by the child's teacher you call the teacher and the teacher says no i didn't see the child have a seizure you want to document very carefully who witnessed the symptoms the names of past clinicians verify prior discharge instructor instructions any against medical advice because sometimes when and i'll say mothers because 95 percent are when the mothers realize that the doctors are starting to suspect them, they will say, I'm gonna sign out and they'll leave the hospital. When they request, you know, I'd like a um, cystic fibrosis sweat test. When they start saying things that sound very knowledgeable and they want, they're telling the doctor what to diagnose, that's a little suspicious as well. And uh, document the behavior of the parent when you tell them the results were negative. Because if they're disappointed, that's unusual. So what causes this behavior? Pretty much all kids fake being sick at some time in their lives. This is normal. It's either to get out of something unpleasant or it's to get that extra special, tender loving care and attention. However, most of us outgrow it. Some of us as adults will fake illness, and that's an adaptive response. You really need a mental health day, so you call in sick. Um, but when it goes to the point of getting unnecessary medical care, then it's a problem. So there's an excellent book by Dr. Mark Feldman, a colleague who helped us write the guidelines, and is pretty much the leading um, expert for the media on what causes this, the perspective of people who have Munchausen disorder themselves. His book, Dying to be Ill, True Stories, really goes into depth about what it's like to be someone with Munchausen or Munchausen by proxy to have that compulsive need to make yourself or your child sick. Um, secondary gain, all right? Attention, money, um, disordered relationships. I've certainly worked in a, the mother who confessed. She said, you know, I'm a teen mother and the dad isn't helping out. Uh, the mom who says, yeah, we'd had a fight. I thought if the kid spiked a temp, he'd come back. There is a disproportionate number of people in the helping professions, and this doesn't surprise us because people who are attracted to the healthcare drama often go to work in it. They're attracted to it, get paid for doing this. 
It's also a compulsive behavior of placing your own needs above those of your child, similar to pedophilia and substance abuse, similar to anorexia, except that in anorexia there isn't a child victim. But it is a high shame compulsive disorder similar to pedophilia, anorexia, and substance abuse. Um, legal issues. So we don't like to call it a mental disorder because then that leaves people thinking um, that it's maybe incompetence as an insanity defense. No, no, no more than being a drunken driver is a defense to a hit and run accident. Um, no more than being a pedophile would be a defense to sexually abusing a child. This is well thought out behavior. Um, there's a very upsetting case, and if any of you in the audience are aware of the follow-up of this, I did call the LA County Board of Supervisors when I read this headline, and I was aware of this lawsuit. Um, this is a couple of years ago. So the LA County Board of Supervisors voted to appeal a $3.1 million judgment against a social worker who removed a child from a mother who was starving her child because of dietary beliefs, but then presenting the child as failure to thrive. And I'll just let you look at this for a minute. And at the end, when we move over to discussion and questions, if any of you have an update on whether or not the appeal was successful and the 3.1 million judgment against a social worker um, to the mother was reversed. I'm very curious to know what happened. Unfortunately, cases like this deter Child Protective Services from um, going after Munchausen cases. When you read the details of it, which I did, I went to the actual case, it was very clearly um, reportable child abuse. I believe there were some technical issues in terms of, or procedural issues that contributed to the judgment, the damages. But basically, um, they said that it was the wrong diagnosis, there was racial discrimination, and the mother was injured by having the child removed. Now, the other kinds of malpractice is if you fail to diagnose Munchausen by proxy, and if you fail to report there have been cases where the family members who are now taking care of a brain injured child will sue the hospital and say, how could you let this go on for so long? The child is damaged because the mother was doing this in your hospital. Um, what about fraud? You know, um, it's sad to say, but I've sometimes seen Prosecutions get much more aggressive to go over the fact that there were fraudulently obtained healthcare services to the tune of half a million dollars than they are upset to get about protecting a child who was unnecessarily had all these surgeries and hospitalizations. Other legal issues are the right to privacy. Do you need a warrant? If you're law enforcement, yes, you need a warrant to get all of these things, but if you're a healthcare provider, um, you can't do these searches without consent, but you certainly can do tox screens, video surveillance. Um, the computers, law enforcement needs a warrant. And again, lock it down, talk to Michael Wepper, read his articles. Management, placement, visitation, treatment, and reunification. So for Child Protective Services, um, definitely work with a Munchausen by proxy consultant. Um, safe placement of the child and if possible siblings are at risk. There was a case in Texas where all five children were bedridden, homebound, homeschooled, and all five children were victims. They got them out of that home. 
and they all started to walk. They didn't need their medicines. Um, they were placed in foster care and they started to thrive. Um, evaluate non-abusing spouse and family members and that requires an intensive evaluation if it is in the maternal family. Um, no unsupervised phone calls or visits. And these parents can be incredibly um, manipulative and clever to get back in their child's life. Um, medical foster care is ideal. If it's not medical foster care, then certainly therapeutic foster care because these children are profoundly traumatized and they have to reconstruct their self-image as not sick. Supervised visitation, no food, no <laughs> drinks, no medicine, absolutely um, review any gifts, limit them, search them. Be aware of subtle messages, verbal, nonverbal, written. The child may initiate an illness conversation, and so you need to coach the parent or the foster parent on how to continue to promote a story of health. Treatment outcomes. Those who are likely to have the best outcomes have the following characteristics. They acknowledge that they did the abuse, they understand it, they have remorse and empathy for the victim. They're motivated to improve, they have above average or average IQ, they have family, friend, and support resources. Um, the abuse was more like the fabricating mom who threw up herself, put it on the baby, and said the baby just threw up. That's a lower severity of abuse other than the fact that the child was in the hospital, which isn't good for kids, unless they need to be there. An ability to put the child's needs first, and here are some references that are um, cited in our guidelines. Those who are less likely to have a good outcome are if the parent has their own history of severe childhood abuse, if they continue to deny that they did anything wrong, they refuse to accept help, they have a severe personality disorder, and they engaged in more severe abuse, for example, suffocation, poisoning, and illness fals um, falsification. And there's another good reference that is in our guidelines. We use the accepts model. This comes from the sex abuse literature and the incest literature and the domestic violence literature. And we're applying it now to the uh, Munchausen or medical child abuse literature. AC, the caregiver is able to fully admit the abuse. It's acknowledge. The caregiver can acknowledge the abuse. C, the caregiver has coping. C is coping. I'm sorry, I need to add those actual words in here. AC is accepts. C is coping. E is empathy. The caregiver is able to demonstrate empathy for the victimized child or children. And not only that, but empathy for the whole family that has been disrupted by this form of abuse. P, parenting. The caregiver has demonstrated appropriate parenting with monitoring over a significant period of time. T, takes charge. If the caregiver is able to say, I have a plan, I'm gonna get a job, I'm not gonna be the full-time parent, um, I'm going to go to uh, a 12-step program, which helps me recognize that I am helpless over my problem, that it's compulsive, um, and S, that they have adequate support, including agreement for medical monitoring, and that they get support from the family. They say, just like an alcoholic would say, I need my whole family to be part of my recovery, a medical child abuser will say, I need my whole family to be part of my recovery. You've got to help me when I start medicalizing or somatizing or I start getting invasive with my child's issues. All right, at this point, I would love to hear cases from the audience. And I don't know, I think I need to go to my chat screen or something, let's see. Um, we just, so we have one question um, so far. And people, again, can use um, the Q&A um, section to ask questions, um, or if it's easier, you can use the chat section. 
Um, so we just have one so far. Um, could this apply to a parent who pursues child sexual abuse claims over and over? It certainly can. And as a matter of fact, there are articles published about that. And it's controversial because there's such a reluctance to ever blame the victim or to not believe child sexual abuse. But once you've had two um, negative forensic exams, that's it. There should not be any further. It, that becomes abusive to the child. And you definitely want to call in somebody um, you know, like Brenda Bursch or somebody with a psychological expertise to be able to evaluate the records in a case like that. Great, thank you. Um, and then we had someone chat in. It looks like they want you to talk more about the non-offending parent. Yes. So, um, whew, we are really sad right now that there are quite a few fathers who are embroiled in what we call high conflict custody disputes. And the initial reaction of Child Protective Services to their reports that they think the mother is munchausening their child or has, is medically child abusing their child is the initial reaction is, uh, wait a minute, this is a high conflict custody case. The mother is saying horrible, horrible, horrible things about the father. And now the father's coming back with horrible, horrible, horrible things. They're, it's sort of like they're using this medical child abuse as a trump card. And this is really, really unfortunate because all concerns about medical child abuse need to be con considered. These mothers are so convincing. They look so polished. They have all the jargon about how they are a victim of this man, how their children are a victim of this man, how the father doesn't believe that the child is sick. In a Texas case, and I can give you a link to that video, uh, it is tragic how a juvenile judge did not recognize the fact that extreme medical child, the child had been hospitalized something like 300 times. And the father said, can I just please see my child? And the mom said, he can't see the child because he doesn't understand the child is sick and the child is dying. And the judge said, no, dad, you cannot see the child. Well, finally, the hospital figured out it was medical child abuse. The mom is in jail. And then they call the dad up and say, oops, sorry, dad, you were right all along. Um, so it's, it's been a huge uphill battle in divorce and custody cases for fathers to have this recognized. Now, there's also a whole slew of cases where the father sticks by the mother. Even when law enforcement are there, they see the lies, they see that the child is thriving when the child has been removed from that family, and they'll go, my wife didn't do this. Those are the fathers that cannot be trusted to have custody of their child because they're in totally embroiled in the mother's um, story. And they're too dependent on that mother. They're, it's, it's like the women who don't leave a sexually abusing man who's abusing their children. They need the man more than they can care for their children. Um, I'm happy to talk more about that, but let's see what else we've got. Yes, it is common to find cases in mental, this question is, um, is it common to find cases in mental health services, like parents seeking therapy for their children? Absolutely. If you would go back to the advisor, the APSAC advisor, there is an entire article written about what this looks like in therapy, mental health and educational school settings. Um, we see children who are kept out of school. We see children who are homeschooled. Um, all those kinds of things when it's all fabricated. 
And then the next question, when the parent turns around and has another child, maybe somewhere else, what strategies should be considered? Okay, so probation. Um, you need a prosecution. You really do. You need some way to keep your um, eyeball on the mother and prevent them from fleeing because again and again and again, when the child is just simply protected without any consequences for the offending parent, the child is just removed. A lot of times the offending mother just goes, walks away, just goes, that's it, I've lost this child, I'll go have another one. And they're very clever about um, going to a completely unknown, you know, first of all, person to have the child with. They'll find a new uh, partner to have a child with and then go to a new doctor and a new, you know, whole arena. Okay. And we did have a question um, in the chat panel. Um, so it was, when there is a case where many doctors from one facility all have concerns that a parent has unknown etiology of several diagnoses, how common is it that CPS will not remove the child or get medical rights removed? I don't know. It's up to you all. I will say that because Texas has been doing trainings, they're getting a whole lot more cases uh, prosecuted. So that brings us to the next thing on this slide, which says, we would love to do an all day training in your area. We have done one in Los Angeles that has resulted in, um, you all can see that, right? That has resulted in um, some more calls and a great deal more awareness. And the training includes a psychologist, a pediatrician, um, I usually go along because I can talk about the covert video surveillance in much more detail. And then either a prosecutor or Michael Weber, the investigator. So we like to have all four areas covered and we go into great detail and then we break up over lunch and we sit in different areas with the four experts so that you can talk about your cases. And, and have us troubleshoot with you. And actually sometimes get involved because we are, all of us, all 18 of us on the, um, on the guidelines, authors of the guidelines who are around the country, we are all available to help, um, help you identify cases. And in California, we have plenty of resources. Okay, perfect. And, um... Yeah, someone, sorry, someone was asking about the cost of that, but I think maybe you'll just, um, do you want them to just email? Well, what I can say is that because of getting all four for all day, we try to keep it just slightly above the costs of meals. We like to provide a continental breakfast with coffee and a nice lunch. Um, and so that's going to be about $60 per attendee. We try to give group rates. Um, and basically it's to cover travel of people who are traveling. But because of CAPSAC, which is the California chapter of APSAC, and CADA and um, CIR, uh, we really try to keep these very cost effective. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I don't see any more questions now, but just as a reminder, if you do have any last minute questions, we do have some time left. So um, if you have questions, either do the Q&A or you can ask them in the chat panel. Um, or we did have one. Let's see. Oh, we just got one. Does domestic violence play a part in any way? Yes. Domestic violence can play a part in several ways. One is that um, sometimes the um, perpetrator of medical child abuse on the child also perpetrates on other family members, including their spouse. There have been several cases where the mother's 
primary motivation for getting the child in the hospital and exaggerating or lying to get the child in the hospital was to get out of an abusive situation. And so you always want to explore how safe is the mother, how safe is the child, um, and explore what's going on in the home situation. But it's like abuse of your child isn't justified by the fact that you're being domestically abused. You're still responsible for over-medicalizing your child. Um, but at the same time, you may need resources, health protection, and safety from a domestic violence situation. We had a mother who was making her child sick and exaggerating because she was homeless. She just had an untenable situation and she knew that her child would get better care in the hospital. So she exaggerated the child's illness and that's understandable and that's a reunifying kind of uh, fabrication. Great, thank you. Um, and we had one more. Um, since many perpetrators travel, can you comment on ways to share medical information across different regions or jurisdictions? The first and what should be the easiest is get the uh, third party payer. Um, I, you know, if they're on, if they're on public, if they're on Medicare, um, is it Medicaid? Whichever one is the one for, uh, you know, your getting assistance, then you go and you say, um, where else are they getting assistance? If they're Kaiser, if they're, um, if they're insurance hopping, then it's a little more difficult, but go the fraud route. Just say, we suspect medical fraud. We suspect that somebody is defrauding their insurance company by um, faking this illness or lying about conditions or unnecessary hospitalizations. We want you to look into this. Great, thank you. Um, and we got another one here. Um, what do you suggest or what is the best way to present information or highlight information in a report to CWS if, if there is only reasonable suspicion and no significant concrete evidence? Well, we're all mandated reporters. And the law says you must report your suspicions of abuse. That is not, you know, it's not the reporter's job to do the investigation. If you are the, if you are Child Protective Services, Child Welfare Services, if that, if that's you, before you notify the parent, do your due diligence to talk to all the collaterals, get all the records. I can go back to that uh, record review slide. That really is the job of CPS, is to gather all records, educational, medical, um, and then start looking at verify, did the child actually vomit? Who saw the child vomit? Was the child actually a preemie? Do you have the birth records? So it's not like you need to go barging in there and tipping everybody off or tipping the mother off until you've done that record review. But that's how you figure out, are we really dealing with child abuse here? Are we, are we dealing with somebody that's lying? Does that make sense? Hopefully. Thank you. That, that was great. Um, and then we had a question, um, have there been any cases of a grandparent being the perpetrator? Yes, we have cases of grandparents, mother's boyfriends, um, foster mothers, babysitters, yes. Thank you. So that's all the questions I see for now. Um, I can kind of give it a minute um, and kind of do my ending stuff. So um, I want to thank everyone for joining today's webinar. Um, just as a reminder, it will be recorded um, or it is being recorded and it'll be put on our website um, within the next couple weeks at CIRinc.org. 
Um, and then when you leave this webinar, um, there will be a survey that should pop up on your screen. If you could please fill that out. Um, we do value the information you put on there and we use that when we plan our next trainings. Um, so yeah, if no one else has any more questions, we'll wrap up and of course, thank you B for being on today. Thank you. Of course. All right. Well, everyone have a great day.